A very good day to you and welcome to the program. It's just so good to be with you. I hope you've got that cup of tea, that cup of coffee, you've turned off that cell phone, closed the door, put your feet up and relax. Folks, I've got a special message for you today from the Word of God. I also want you to know that before we start these programs, every single time we pray for you. We pray for the program, we pray for the weather, we pray for the sound, and we want to thank God for the crew that are making this program. We praise God for these young men are dedicated to Jesus Christ. That's why they do it. They don't do it for the money, they don't do it for the fame, you don't even see them. But they love the Lord, and that's why God is blessing them. So if you've got your agricultural handbook with you, please. That's right, your Bible. I'm reading out of the New King James Bible. And I'm going to be reading from John chapter 12. And it's the account of the anointing at Bethany. And by the way, I love Bethany. Bethany, if you haven't had the privilege of going to Israel, is you leave Jerusalem, the old city. You go down through the Kidron Valley up the Mount of Olives, and just over the top is the little village of Bethany. And I've got a sneaky feeling that was one of Jesus' favorite places, because he used to spend a lot of time with his friends there. I think Jesus' best friend, I'm not talking about disciples, was probably Lazarus. He loved Lazarus. And of course, Lazarus, as you know, had two sisters. One was Martha, one was Mary. And he often used to stay with them. And when he came to Jerusalem, he'd always stay there and then come down to Jerusalem the next day. So Jesus was at Bethany, and this is what happened. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. I've been to that tomb. I actually went right down into that tomb. I actually got into the tomb, folks, and I actually lay there. And I tried to visualize what, what an incredible miracle it must have been when Jesus said to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. He'd been dead and buried for four days. In the Middle East, they bury a body within 12 hours because it starts to decay. And Lazarus came out of there and he was absolutely perfectly healed. Let's just continue. Verse 2. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with Jesus, with him. Verse 3. Then Mary took a pound, that's probably half a kilo, of very costly oil, of spikenard, which is a perfume, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of this oil. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, verse 5, Why was this fragrant oil not sold? for 300 denarii and given to the poor. Folks, 300 denarii, they say, was the equivalent of a full year's wages. Now, sir, you watching this program, I don't know what you get every month, but I want you to sit there and do a calculation. Times your wage, your monthly wage by 12. That's how much this oil was worth. So we're talking about a lot of money, a whole year's wages. Verse 6, this is what um, Judas Iscariot said. This is said not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. Verse 7, then Jesus said, let her alone. Leave her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. And verse 8, the poor that... The poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. My dear friend, I want to speak to you today about priorities, 
and more importantly about motives. What is your motive for giving? You see, it sounded like Judas Iscariot was so concerned about the so-called waste of the value of that expensive perfume that he wanted the money to alleviate the plight of the poor. But he did not do that. He was a liar and he was a thief. He wanted that money for his own personal gain. I want to ask you, what is your motive for giving? Why do you give to God? Now, I think I'm going to stand on some people's toes, but there's, <laughs> that's nothing new, is it? I'm, I'm sharing my heart with you. Why do you give to God's work? Do you give in order to receive? Yes, the Bible says that if you give to God, He'll give back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. We know God's heart. God is a giver. You cannot give more to God. He's given you everything. For greater love has no man than this, than a man would lay down his life for his friend. The most that I could ever give you is not what I've got in my pocket. It's my life. It's my very blood that runs through my veins. And Jesus did that for you and for me. When he died on the cross of Calvary, he died so that your sins and my sins would be forgiven. He said before he died, it is finished. It is completed. He's given us the victory. So why do you give to the church? Why do you tithe? Well, because the Bible says I must tithe. Of course. And why do you give gifts? Because the tithe is God's anyway. So it's what you give after that, actually, that really counts. For what reason? You see, some people say, no, well, if you give to God, you'll get back. Is that a, is that a motive? I have, to, I have to question that. I want to be quite honest with you. If you are giving purely so that you can get back, I don't think that's acceptable. I, I sincerely hope you don't give me a gift because you want me to give you a greater gift back. To me, that actually stinks. We give because we love. Mary broke that, 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 that uh, cask of expensive oil over Jesus' feet and washed his, wiped his feet with her hair because she loved him. She didn't want anything back for him. She just loved him. I hope, sir, you don't go and buy an expensive gift for your wife because you want something in return from her. I sincerely hope not, because that is not love. That's a business deal. That's like when you go to an insurance company, and the insurance agent says, if you put this mon much money back into the, into the company, we'll work that money for you, and we'll give you a hundredfold back. That's a business deal. There's no love involved there. It's strictly business. I'm not saying that's wrong. But it's wrong if your motive is that you're giving to God because you want something back from God. Job said in the book of Job, which they say is the oldest book in the Bible. I don't know how they work it out. That's what the theologians say. In Job chapter 13, verse 15, Job says, Even though he slay me, yet will I still trust him. Folks, that's love. That's relationship, unconditional surrender. Not, well, Lord, if you don't bless me, I'm not going to give to you. And I know, folks, I know there are many of us that come from the angle of you give to God and he'll give back to you. Actually, I want to tell you something. That is actually the truth. But is that the motive? You see, God is a giver. You can't outgive God. The more you give to God, the more He gives back to you. But why do you give? If you say, I'm giving to God because I want to double my money or quadruple my money or get a hundredfold back, I'm telling you, as far as I'm concerned, that's not even acceptable. Because if my wife is buying me gifts because she wants something out of me, not because she loves me, I don't even want that gift. I don't know about you. I want, I want you to really search your heart today. 
And I think a lot of people stay out of the kingdom because of that mentality. A money-making business. We need to be careful that we are not part of that. We don't give money to people or to the church for a return. We give money to the church because Jesus Christ is our Savior and for what He's done for us. And that's all. Nothing else. Jesus even went so far as to say to Judas Iscariot, the poor you will have with you always, but you won't always have me. I'm doing this program and so is my team, not because we are asking you for anything, but because we love Him. And He told us in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's why we are doing it. And by the way, yes indeed, He is supplying all of our needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. My God shall supply all of my needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Far be it from me that I try to orchestrate this ministry and then have the audacity to say it's from God. When in the meantime, it is my commercial expertise. We are not doing these programs for business. We are doing these programs because we have been called by God. We are not hirelings. We are sons. And God supplies the needs of His sons and daughters. Okay? We are not hirelings. We are sons. And I'm so proud of that. And I can tell you from the day that I started preaching the gospel to this day, I have never been short. God does not supply my wants. He supplies my needs. It's a big difference, folks. You know, Smith Wigglesworth was a great evangelist. He was a very prosperous plumber by trade. He was what they call a master plumber. He lived in Yorkshire, England. He called a spade a shovel. He didn't mix his words. He said to God when he started to preach the gospel, the day that my heels wear down on my shoes, I'm going back to the bench. And his heels never wore down. He was always dressed in a three-piece suit. That was the fashion. And he never wanted for anything. When I started this ministry, I didn't start this ministry because I couldn't make ends meet on the farm. God blessed and He's still blessing our farms. But I laid it down. My children have it now. I don't have it at all. I said, Lord, the day that I have to ask your children for money is the day I'm going back to the plow. I'm going back to the farm. That was 36 years ago. I am still not back plowing. I probably wouldn't know how to plow. <laughs> it's been a long time. I can still ride snow with her. Folks, I want to tell you, you give because of a love relationship. You don't give because you want something back. What you do is you go, the Lord says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. Matthew chapter 7 verse 7. And please understand where I'm coming from. I'm not saying it's, it's wrong to ask from God. He says, call unto me and I will answer you and I'll show you great and mighty things of which you do not know. Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3. Of course, we don't live on fresh air. We're very much in the world. We have to pay accounts. We have to eat. We have to pay wages to our staff. But he's doing it. And he's doing it through people who love him. Okay, let me use another example because maybe somebody watching this program is not understanding me correctly. I'm talking about the anointing at Bethany. What was the motive of Mary breaking that expensive alabaster gift which, of, of perfume, which was 12 months wages? What, what was the purpose? The purpose was one thing only. She loved him. She loved God. She wanted to bless him. And what did he say? Don't do that. 
You can, you, we, we could feed maybe a thousand people for a year. She didn't, he didn't say that. He said, leave her alone. See? Because Jesus was being blessed by Mary. There was no ulterior motive. Let me give you an example. God says we must fast. Okay? Now, I remember many years ago when we used to take in people here that had problems. Sometimes it was... Um, maybe nervous breakdowns, maybe it was, it was all kinds of things. And, and, and when we had a lady here who had an eating disorder, an eating disorder, okay? And we were just loving her and just getting her back on her feet here. And the one day I felt the Lord wanted me to fast, okay? And I was going to go on a fast. I can't remember how many days it was. Now, obviously, in the family, you can't hide it. Okay, you don't tell people out there. Remember, Jesus said, if you're fasting, see, again, we come to motive. Then you must wash your face, have a shave, brush your hair, look smart. Don't let anybody know that you're fasting. Otherwise, you've lost your blessing. But your family knows because you don't eat anything at lunch and you don't eat anything at the dinner table because we like to sit together as a family. Okay, I hope you do as well. It's the most important meal of the day, that evening meal. That's why Holy Communion is the most important uh, Christian act in the Bible. Jesus was sitting around the table speaking to his disciples. If you don't sit down at the table, you'll never speak to each other. And so this young lady, when she heard that I was going to fast, straight away she said, I'll also fast with you as well. See, but folks, I'm sorry to tell you this. Her motive was wrong. She was not going to fast for some personal reason in her own life with regards to communion with God. She was fasting because she didn't want to eat food because she had a problem. And she thought she was putting on too much weight because we had her eating correctly. Be careful what your motive is. See, if you go on a Daniel fast, by the way, a Daniel fast, a 21-day fast, and you, you eat only vegetables. Now, you see, I know a man who was, was eating grapes. Now, that's okay. But you must be sure that you say, this is not a fast. What I'm doing, I'm detoxing my body. So don't fool other people and yourself. And most of all, you can't fool God and say, I'm going on a 21-day Daniel fast because I'm wanting some answers from God. But the meantime, in the meantime, back at the ranch, what you're doing is you're going on a detox so that your body will be strong. That is not fasting. It's an impure motive. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying it's wrong to detox. Not at all. But don't try and fool people and say that's a fast. That's not a fast. A fast is when you're wanting to get answers from God. A fast is when you're spending time in the presence of God. When you're dealing with issues in your life. Jesus himself went on a 40-day fast. Food and water. There's no human being on earth can do that. And don't let anybody tell you that he can. The body starts closing down after four days if you don't drink water and then you die. So I want to say to you that um, whatever you do, whether it's giving, whether it's service, do it out of a heart of love. You see, when I was a young boy, I grew up in Central Africa. And sometimes missionaries would come out of the Congo, especially after the disaster that took place there when the army um, mutineered against the officers, the Belgian officers, and then they started attacking the missionaries and they started to slaughter the missionaries. And some of those missionaries would come out of the Congo. I was a small boy. We, had, we were sent back from our schools. We had to go home. They used the schools so that these Belgian people could, could, could be uh, helped. It was a terrible, terrible thing. They had to run a gauntlet of gunfire. Some of them arrived in northern Rhodesia, as it was then, Zambia, now in their pajamas. They got out of their beds at night, took their children, and they just drove. Okay? Now, out of that, some missionaries would come out, and they were bitter and twisted. You know? We've spent so many years, and what have we got for it? Nothing. What was their motive? You see, if God tells you to go and preach the gospel, and your response is zero or very little, that's got nothing to do with your calling. All God wants from you is obedience. Okay? You don't know what you've left up there. 
Oswald Chambers died at the age of 43 years old, folks, in the desert in Egypt during the First World War. He wrote one book. In fact, he didn't even write it. It was a collection of readings that his wife gathered together and made a book called My Utmost for His Highest. And that book is probably the greatest devotional of all time. Okay? I want to tell you, he didn't even know what he was doing there, but he was obedient to God. And out of his obedience and his wife's obedience, by the way, she was the one who put it together, and she never even mentioned her name, folks. She used to put a little B-C. I think her name was Becky or something like that. It was a nickname. Becky Chambers. Never even put anything there. It's Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest. She put it together. Those are the people that are, that are going to receive a reward in heaven. Motive is so important. Two days ago, I was picked up by a jet. One of the latest jets in the airport just close to our farm. And I was taken to a conference. We didn't have to pay one cent. These people came. They used their own jet. They used their own fuel, their own pilots. They even had food and drinks on board for me and the team. I walked through to the front during the flight. And I said to these young men, I don't know what to say. I can't thank you. I don't have money to pay you or anything. And they looked at me and they said, don't even mention it, Angus. Because you're starting to rob us of our blessing. Okay? Don't even thank us. I said, I have to thank you. They said, no. We are doing this for Jesus Christ. This is our way of propagating the word of God. Very successful young businessman. Taking a very expensive um, vehicle to take uh, the word of God to the people. They don't want anything for it. Those men, I can tell you as I'm speaking now, and some of them are watching this program, are going to receive an amazing reward from God. Because God has seen their heart just like Mary. Now I want to pray for you. Because maybe you've had a, a bit of a mixed up idea about what giving is all about. Giving is not for your own personal gain. Giving is because you love God. I'm preaching the gospel because of what God's done for me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the example of Mary from Bethany. And Lord, I pray that we too will take our alabaster jars of expensive ointment whatever that might be and sow it into your kingdom not for any personal reward but purely because we love you and we know lord that you will give it back to us a hundredfold pressed down shaken together and running over that's a that's a given because of your nature but we're not doing it for that we're doing it because we love you and we want to see the lost saved before you come again i ask this in jesus name amen until next time, may God bless you.